thank you, Lori, for reminding us this morning, reminding us this morning that we're here to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. What a beautiful way to begin our service today. Thank you for being here. It's a beautiful day outside. Uh, the sun's shining through. It's nice to see that. And we're glad you're here on this holiday weekend. Thank you for choosing to worship with this church family this week. If you're a guest, especially a first-time guest, we welcome you and we pray that through this service that you feel as everybody else the presence of the Lord in this place. Inside your bulletin there, there's a connect form. If you will just look at that and if, uh, give us whatever information you'd like for us to have. It's perforated so you can tear it off and drop it in the offering plate as it's passed or hand it to one of us uh, after the service today. We'd just love to have whatever information you'd like to give us. We'd be honored if you would do that. But thank you for worshiping with us today. And again, I pray that you feel God's presence as we lift up his name and honor him and glorify him throughout this service today. Why don't you stand and greet those around you in the name of the Lord. And what a beautiful prayer this is. Come thou fount of every blessing. You join as we lift our voices in praise together. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You join as we continue to worship together.
Let us bow for the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us here at the Forks. You've truly blessed us. We ask that your hand continue to be with us in larger territory so we can bring glory and honor to your name. Keep us from evil also so that we can live pure and holy lives. At this time of the service, where we take up tithes and offerings, let us remember that it's just a small portion we're returning unto you to do your work in this place and show others the love of Christ. Let us always remember that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. It's in his name and glory we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for leading us so beautifully, leading us in worship. We are made to worship. You stand as we join, lifting our voices together, made to worship.
What a beautiful day it is to be in the house of God and to sing praise and glory to the only one who is worthy to be praised. And we are so thankful that all of you are here, especially if this is your first time worshiping with us. Thank you for coming to be a part of this worship time together. Also, to let you know, every week there's an opportunity, if you feel led by the Holy Spirit, to come to this altar to pray. It's a time that we can humble ourselves before a loving, almighty God, and to pour out our praise and thanksgiving, and to pour out our pain, our worry, our fear, our depression, our loneliness, our brokenness, to know God is able. He's able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. So this morning, if you feel led to come kneel or stand at this altar to pray for a family member, a friend, or a need in your own life, I invite you to come join me as we lift up our prayers together. Would you come pray with me today? May we pray. Oh God, we have come into this house to worship you and to praise you and to exalt you and to acknowledge the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Father, we have come to humble ourselves in your sight, trusting you that you will lift us up. God, this morning we lift up all these who have gathered at this altar, many who are praying from their seats, others may be watching on live stream, wherever they might be. Oh God, touch them with the fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit. Remove anything from our hearts and lives that would hinder our relationship with you. Remove doubt, remove fear, remove a critical spirit, Remove anger, remove unforgiveness, remove pride and sin. Oh God, give us a pure heart so that we can see you. And Father, we lift up many on our prayer list that are struggling, many recovering from surgeries, others facing surgeries, many going through treatments of one kind or another, but we know who the great healer is. We know who the great physician is. And we pray, oh God, if it be your will, to bring a miracle of healing. God, we pray that today for those who have come in looking for a sign, that you might reveal to them what your perfect will is, what direction to go in a relationship, what direction to go as far as a job, what direction to go, O oh God, in making an important spiritual decision. May this be the day. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless and protect this church. You have done and continue to do a great work. And we pray that we might keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. We pray that you would protect us from evil and harm. Protect our families, our homes, our schools our workplaces from evil. And oh God, we pray for this nation that you would continue to bring peace and unity. And we pray, God, for our world that the good news of Jesus might continue to be preached to the ends of the earth. And oh God, we just pray this morning if there are those who have never placed their faith and trust in you that today would be the day on this Labor Day weekend, that many would come to know Jesus Christ. Thank you, O oh God, for your faithfulness and your promise to be with us. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to guide us through this service with your Holy Spirit. Bless Grayson and sing through him in just a moment. And God, preach through the power of your word and your servant that we all might be drawn closer to you. For we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we need you right now. In the strong and holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
This morning, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, we'll be reading two verses, and I'm so grateful today that Grayson Thurman, one of our students, one of our young men in our student ministry is coming to sing. He did a beautiful job at the 830 service, and Grayson, thank you for being here again at this service. Would you be in prayer for Grayson as he comes to lead us after the reading of God's word? Begin with verse 27, Luke 6. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. This is the word of the Lord, and blessed be the name of the Lord. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, that all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, it trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. God, 
Praise God. We, we applaud because God is great, and we applaud because grace and God has blessed you, and what a beautiful job that you're using your talents for the glory of our great God. Thank you so much. What a great day it is to be in the house of God. You know, you could have been anywhere else on this holiday weekend, but you took the time out to be in God's house. That's why I'm going to give you a funny joke this morning. <laughs> And hopefully a good sermon to follow, but I, I want it to be worth your time. Uh, maybe you've heard a, a story of an old uh, town many years ago, a little boy. You know, back in the day, in a small town, the drugstore was about the only place to shop. And so this little boy went into the local drugstore. Remember, they used to call the pharmacist the druggist. And so this little boy went up to the druggist, and he said... Uh, I need three boxes of candy. I need a one-pound box, a three-pound box, and a five-pound box of candy, and I need them gift-wrapped. The druggist said, okay, told the girl behind the counter to go get the candy and to wrap them. And the druggist said to the little boy, he said, son, I don't mean to be nosy, but he said, that's a very unusual request that you would have three boxes of candy all at different weights. I'm just curious what do you need them for? And he said, sir, I am happy to tell you. As a matter of fact, I'm excited to tell you why I need these three boxes of candy. Tonight, I have a date with the prettiest girl in the entire school. And he said, we're going over to her parents' house to, to eat dinner. And he goes, after dinner, we're going to go out on the front porch in the porch swing. And he said, if I get to hold her hand, I'm going to give her the one-pound box of candy. He said, if I get to put my arm around her, I'm going to give her the three-pound box of candy. And he said, and if I get to kiss her, I'm going to give her the five-pound box of candy. The man said, okay. Well, later that night, the boy went over to the, the girl's house and and there the father asked the young man if he would say the blessing over the food. That little boy prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed around the world and back again, and he prayed, and prayed a little bit more, and finally he said amen. The little girl leaned over, and she said, I didn't know you were so religious. He said, I didn't know your daddy was the druggist. <laughs> Oh, my, that was funny. Oh, I told you. <laughs> told you it'd be worth your time. Oh, wow, the last few weeks, we've been going through a series, How to Build a Better Christian. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that Jesus Christ is our prototype. He is our model he is our example, and if we really want to build a better Christian life, then we must follow the example of Jesus Christ. We learn that we must put away old ways, old habits, old negative, defeated thinking, and we must allow our character to reflect the character of Christ. 
Last week, we talked about the importance of submitting ourselves to God and staying away from the devil. And we talked about that the process must start now of drawing near to God, and he will draw near to us. You see, the closer we get to Jesus, the more our spiritual eyes are open. And you know what else happens the closer we get to Jesus? the more aware we are of our sin, the more we're convicted of where we need improvement, how we need to tear out and we need to rebuild or we need to build for the first time our faith in Jesus Christ. Today in our scripture passage, we see in Luke's gospel, the Sermon on the Plain. Now in Luke chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain, it is to be paralleled with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthews chapter 5 through 7. Do you remember that Jesus was giving that moral and ethical discourse that many thought was too, uh, too great to achieve, that the standard, the bar was set so high that he really didn't mean for us to live it out. But the truth of the matter is we can't live it out on our own strength but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. Both in Luke and in Matthew, it begins with the Beatitudes and it ends with the lesson of the builder. And again, both of these sermons were setting a standard for those of us who truly want to be like Jesus Christ. But at the heart of being a follower of Christ, and if you're serious about wanting to build a better Christian life, then we have to become a more loving person. Would you say that you're a loving person or a cold person? Would you say you're a warm-hearted person or a cold-spirited, cold-hearted? More importantly, what would your wife or your husband or your son or your daughter or your co-worker or your friend say that you're cold-hearted or you're a loving person? warm part. You know, I just feel better when I'm around you because of the love that oozes from you. Or would they say, I can't wait to get away from you because of how cold and negative you always are. The fact of the matter is at the heart of the teaching of Jesus, he taught us to love. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, you remember what he said in Mark 12, 30 and 31? But the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Today, some of you are here, and, and maybe you're having trouble loving someone. Maybe you're here today, and you're having trouble forgiving someone. Maybe you're here today, and you don't feel loved. You don't feel accepted. It's my prayer today that through this message that we would all become more loving. I mean, I'm telling you at the heart of God's word, if you want to condense it to one word, best word that could describe it all would be love. And I pray that we would all become more loving people. How? Well, Jesus said in verse 27 of our scripture passage, but I say to you who are listening, again, he was preaching it primarily to his disciples, those learners of Christ, but others certainly were there, other followers of Christ, other onlookers, other listeners. I, I say to all you all who are listening that we are to love our enemies or to love your enemies. What? Love our enemies? Are you kidding me? Love my parent who abused me. Love my spouse who left me. Love my friend who hurt me and betrayed me. Uh, you mean love my boss who fired me? Pastor author Rick Warren said, those who choose to resent, you give a piece of your heart a piece of your attention, a piece of your mind. Do you want to do that? You will always remain the victim if you harbor this anger or this unforgiveness in your heart. You cannot truly love your spouse 
or love your child or love your brother and your sister if you have unresolved anger in your heart and in your spirit. You can't love them like they deserve to be loved until you get rid of these angry feelings. As a matter of fact, Paul said in Colossians 3.13 to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.2 that we are to bear with one another in love. And it's important that today that we would, as difficult as it is, <laughs> to love our enemies. But then he goes on to say, to do good to those who hate you. You mean I got to do good to people that don't even like me and that I may not even care for? That's right. And what does he mean by doing good? Well, to do good means to, to give to that person. It, it means to to meet a need it means to do them a favor it means to to go the second mile you've heard that old saying i'll kill them with kindness i like to say fill them with kindness fill them with so much kindness that they can't help but see the love of christ coming from you and coming from me some of you all remember a few years ago we went to see the movie war room as a church do you remember that one of the stars in the movie was Priscilla Shirer? And do you remember that Priscilla Shirer also wrote a book called Fervent? My wife reminded me of a story in the book Fervent of Priscilla Shirer having a group of friends, a circle of friends that they did life together. Priscilla Shirer shared that one of those moments where she went to bed praising God and got up in the morning praising God because of his blessings in her life personally and her ministry and, and how God was working. She shared that with her circle of friends. Most rejoiced, but one did not. One, as a matter of fact, was not friendly at all. As a matter of fact, they were critical and negative toward her. And she thought, I've never done anything to this person. But yet she distanced herself and and even her other circle of friends noticed how this other friend had pulled back and was no longer friendly or no longer wanted to engage with the others. So much so that even some of Priscilla Shirer's friends began to leave this woman alone. Priscilla said she did what she thought was best. She tried to stay clear. Wherever she was, she tried not to be. Whenever she came in the room, she tried to walk out. She tried to stay away. But then the Lord convicted her. <laughs> and she began to pray. And God began to impress on her heart to forgive her. And not only to forgive her, but to do good to her or for her. <laughs> Some of us know someone that we need to forgive, but we say to do good to them? Or for them? That's, that's asking a little much. Well, Priscilla Shirer followed the Lord's lead. And she made a meal. And she took it over to this friend. And she began to pour out her heart. And they sat down and ate this meal together. And before the meal was over, the woman, her friend, broke down and cried. And she began to share about pain in her life and how she had felt abandoned or forsaken by not only her, but her other friends. And, and she felt as though there was something, a wedge between them. And, and anyway, God began to heal this relationship because Priscilla Shower was willing to follow God's lead, not only to forgive, but to do something good. And maybe you know something good that you can do for someone that maybe does not care for you. Maybe there's a neighbor, you all have had your spats. Why don't you, maybe when it's trash day, take their trash cans back to their house and, and leave them at the garage door. Uh, or maybe it's going by Starbucks and taking a cup of coffee to that coworker that you know you've not been getting along with. Maybe there's something you can good, do good for someone to improve your relationship. 
Paul said in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so we keep doing our part. We keep doing good. Doing good to those who even hate you. But then he goes on to say in verse 28, to bless those who curse you. What does it mean to bless? That means to say a positive word. That means to speak a, a blessing on someone or about someone. A positive and encouraging word. How many of us are ready when someone curses us, we're ready to curse them back? Somebody honks their horn out on the road and, and says or does that we're ready to ride on our horn and let them hear it and give it back. But yet we read in Proverbs 12, 18 that reckless words are like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft word or a gentle word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Have you been blessing those who have been cursing you? If you want to build a better Christian, if you want to be Christ-like, if you want to follow the example of Christ, we must bless those. Think about what Jesus went through. The only perfect person ever to live. He was mocked and spat upon and flogged and, and he was scourged and had his flesh torn and uh, he had nails driven in his hands and his feet and a crown of thorns on his head and a, a sword thrust into his side. And yet Jesus Christ did not retaliate, nor did he make threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. You know, through the years, it, it's funny how God in different seasons, I remember years ago, um, one day hearing somebody come into the office, and uh, our church office, and they were uh, obviously upset, so much so that I, I came out of my office into our secretary, my secretary Jessica's office, and, and this person was so angry and, and just fighting mad, as a matter of fact, they came up to me. I'm not making this stuff up. I'm not ministerially speaking. This actually happened. This part, I need to be writing this stuff down for my book. But these, this guy came up to me, and he got right in my face. I'm so angry right now. I can just hit you. And I said, Jessica, take care of him right now. <laughs> you got to come through Jessica first. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't say that. But you know what? He was fighting mad. And I said, I could see, obviously, he was having a bad day. And I said, why don't we step out of the office? Why don't you walk in here to the sanctuary with me again? Fists clenched, and he was gritting his teeth, and he was shaking it right in my face. And, and I said, calm down. Now tell me what's going on. Talk to me. And he began to pour out his heart of how upset he was of some past things and some guilt that he had and some anger towards some people that he had felt mistreated. And he didn't know where else to turn, but he turned to the church and he came to me. And sometimes we as ministers, sometimes people feel like they can unload on you. And we won't unload back. <laughs> He just unloaded and unloaded. And that's why sometimes people, when they're coming to church, nobody else will listen to them at work or even in their own home. But they think church, a representative of God, they'll listen to me. And that's what we're called to do. And sometimes I have to tell you, I've had to bite my tongue because I've wanted to unload back. But that would not be glorifying to God, nor would it help the person. As a matter of fact, we're to bless those men. Before it was all said and done, we hugged each other. We prayed with one another. And he went on his way. But he just needed to get all that off his chest. And he, just, he was just angry, fighting mad so much so he just wanted to pet somebody in the face. So I gave him a couple of y'all's numbers to call later if that ever, if you ever feel this way again, let me write this down. Anyway, I'm kidding. We are to... 
Bless those who curse you and then to pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Again, how difficult is that? You know what happens when we pray for those who mistreat us? We're not only praying that they change, but through the process, hopefully we're changing as we're praying for them to change. God is growing us. God is making us a better person. God is, is creating a spirit of healing in us and in that relationship. So to pray for those who mistreat you, what great example did we have of this is when Jesus was there on the cross and some of his very last words in Luke 23, 34, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus was praying for those who were mistreating him and crucifying him and spitting on him and laughing at him. Jesus was praying for him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. We are to pray for people even when they mistreat us and hurt us beyond measure. We pray for them. My wife gave me a book that she had read quite some time ago, The Power of a Praying Parent by a stormy American. And she wrote in this book, and she also wrote The Power of a Praying Wife. She wrote several books, but... In this book, um, at the very beginning, she shared a journal entry that her 13-year-old daughter at the time had written. Amanda had written at age 13. She wrote that there was a girl at school when she was 13 that was being very mean to her. She had never done a thing to this girl. This girl was being very mean to her. For no reason, said she had never done anything to her. As a matter of fact, she said this girl scared her. So she tried to stay away from this girl. So she said after a while, she went to her mom and said, Mom, this girl frightens me. She scares me at school. She's mean to me, and I've not done anything. I promise I've not done anything to her. Walked around scared. Her mother said, Amanda, don't you think we need to start praying for her? And she said, I, okay, mom. So they started praying for this girl at school. They prayed for her the entire rest of the school year, prayed for her all summer long. And then when school started back the following year, Amanda wrote in her journal entry, a miracle took place. She and this girl became best friends said it was a miracle. They became the very best friends. She said, now I know my mom's prayers don't always work like this, but she said, God did hear these prayers and brought us together as best friends. Look, God begins a change process when we can not only pray for people, but while we're praying for people, we're asking him to change us too. To change up. I pray that my husband changes. I pray that my wife changes. I'm praying that my child changes. I'm praying that my coworker changes. I'm praying that my brother, that he'll open his eyes, my sister, when maybe we need to look in the mirror and say, I'm the one that needs to change and quit blaming everybody else for what we need to do to get our life together, to get our house in order with God. And today, if you really want to become a better Christian, the first step is you've got to surrender your heart and life to him. Quit trying to control your own life and give him the reins, give him the steering wheel, give him full control of your life. Say, Lord, take my life, lead me, make my life useful for thee. Here I am, Lord, send me. Use me for your kingdom and your glory. Or maybe you're here today and, and you're a Christian, but you know you've not been acting very Christ-like. You've been the one riding on the horn. You've been the one cursing at that bypass. Or you've been the one cursing at your child. You've been the one where your families had to walk on eggshells. 
maybe today you're going to say, I can't be this kind of person anymore for everyone's sake in my home. Or maybe you're here today and you've been looking for a church home. I say it every week. I love it that we're not a perfect church. We serve a perfect God. I'm not a perfect pastor. We're not a perfect staff, but we serve a perfect God. And if you're looking at him, there's no fault in him. If you're looking at me or us, you'll find fault in us. There's no fault in Christ. And if you've never met him today, I'm inviting you to meet him. Ask him to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins and begin this process of becoming a better person, becoming a better Christian. Aren't you ready to do that even now as we pray together? God, I pray right now in the stillness of this moment that if there are any men or women or young people or children that have never given their heart and life fully surrendered to you, that, that this would be the day that one too many would come to know Jesus Christ, to come and confess their sin and ask you for forgiveness and invite you to come into their life to live forever. Lord, maybe there are Christians that have gotten off track and they've become angry and resentful and we know being resentful, we're only giving away part of our heart and our lives and, and we are to forgive as you forgave us. Forgive us, God, for when we hold resentment and anger toward people. Or Lord, maybe there are folks who have been looking for a church home and and uh, we're not perfect, but we, we try to be more like Christ. We try to humbly acknowledge when we make mistakes and ask for forgiveness and try to repent and try not to be those kind of people anymore, to be better, to be stronger. So God, just lead us right now. We, we trust in you. You know more than we know. And your timing is always perfect. I pray that, that your perfect will will be done even now as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand and come as we sing a hymn of invitation. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead me, Lord. Make my you be seated for a moment. I'm so thankful today that Sabrina LeCompte, if you would come up here beside me, uh, Sabrina and I got to visit at one of her dear friends, Janet Carrick's surgery, just a couple of weeks ago in the waiting room, and 
She said she had been visiting here off and on for many years. I couldn't believe it. Nine. Nine years. And she said, I was waiting till I heard a funny joke before I would join the church. <laughs> She's waited nine years. <laughs> Sabrina told me at that time that she needed to, she was ready to join. She said, I don't know why I haven't. She's already a Christian, but she wants to unite with this family of faith. Sabrina, we welcome you. I know God has led you here. We pledge our love and prayers and support to you. And I know you want to pledge your love and prayers and support to Sabrina by letting it be known by saying amen. Amen and applause. Bless you. You can be seated. And after the service, Sabrina, would you join me out in the foyer so folks could give you a warm welcome to this family of faith. I also want to share with you exciting news that uh, today, a uh, little Barrett Couch made a public profession of his faith. This is Zach and Kara Couch's son. So grateful that Barrett came to Christ this morning. So if you get an opportunity to, to send a card or letter uh, congratulating him, that would be great. Then one more announcement. As you're leaving today, there's a basket out in the foyer. Uh, one of our members who no longer lives in this community Wendy Choir's mom, Edna Choir, is about to turn 100. And uh, if you would feel led to write a note or send a card, uh, Joyce has a basket out on the round table. We would love for you to send her an encouraging word. It's not every day you meet somebody that turns 100. So there is a card, a, a basket for you to drop a card, an encouraging note, just to encourage Edna as she continues to fight the good fight. But thank you for being here. There will not be evening service tonight. Spend this time uh, with family and loved ones. Next Sunday night, we'll begin our songs of September. We're gonna have a different concert every Sunday night in September. Some outstanding musicians are gonna be leading us. Hope you'll join us for those. But at this time, would you stand? Thank you for coming. Happy Labor Day to you. It's great to have Bill and Linda back with us from vacation. Bill, if you'll lead us in a closing song. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the pray oh God thank you for the great things you have done and for the great things that you still have ahead may we keep our eyes fixed upon you and follow you uh, sharing your love with the world where people need the Lord in Jesus name amen